Well, hey, everybody. I'm really excited to be live tonight with the one, the only Sean Mills of Hack My Solar. Sean, how are you doing tonight? I'm awesome. How are you, Nicole? I'm apparently more energetic than you are. What are you drinking there? Oh, uh, just water. That's what I've got, too. Yeah. <laughs> Fizzy water from the soda stream. So I brought you on today to just start talking about solar and going off grid and some of those basic things. And of course, folks in the audience, if you have questions, just put them in all caps that we want to ask Sean Mills. But let's start with this. How did you go from like being a dude in, in high school and, you know, chasing chicks and end up Mr. Off Grid Solar Guy? Oh, yeah, that's a long story. So I'll try to tell it uh, quickly. Um, you know, right after 2008, I decided I needed to uh, get my poop in a group, so to speak. And uh, I know a lot of us in the kind of preparedness community came into it around that time. And so, you know, starting right after 2010, um, I had gotten a promotion at work. I was running a couple offices and I really wanted to try to find something that I could take partially off the grid because uh, I like the idea of it. And um, we, my wife and I ended up finding a place in Linden, Tennessee, which is about halfway between Jackson and Dixon, Tennessee. And um, it was already 100 percent off the grid. The price was right. Uh, so we jumped into it with both feet. So, you know, the idea initially was get something that we could start with and play around with some off grid stuff. And instead we moved into a house that didn't even have access to the grid, um, lived off of a generator for a while, then went to a generator and a battery bank. And then uh, the year after that, we actually added solar and started really focusing a little bit more on the lifestyle design part of it. Uh, so that living off the grid was, it became relatively easy. Uh, and then, you know, over the over the course of several years, we added some other projects like rainwater harvesting, um, which primarily was um, it was a strategy to save electricity. We had a well that was a three horsepower well pump and it needed uh, about 7000 watts to kick on. And I said, well, if we store water at ground level, I can use a 700 watt um, pump to pressurize the system. So. Um, so yeah, that's kind of how we got into it. It was just, the idea was to tiptoe in and we, you know, we just dove off the 30 meter platform instead. Yeah. Have, have you and your, your awesome wife ever done anything differently though? Don't you always no. just dive in? <laughs> no. We, we talk about it and we, we make a plan on uh, how we're going to, how we're going to kind of try things out and then we just dive right in. Yeah. That, I've noticed that about both of you. It's like once you decide, you're like all in, fully committed. And that's that's kind of fun. So, OK, so people who are listening to this may not have gone off the grid, but a lot of us are looking at increased um, energy prices coming our way. There's lots of rumors about winter is coming. Um, what's the advice that, for, that you would give somebody kind of new to this whole thing to just start with something? That, that's really easy to do? Well, you know, we talk a lot about solar thermal. And so when you talk about solar energy, um, you've got thermal energy and you've got photovoltaic energy. And so photovoltaic are the panels. It's where you're actually collecting photons, which is light energy um, and, and turning it into usable electricity. Solar thermal is you're collecting the radiant energy that comes from the sun. That's much easier to collect uh, you can use it immediately. You don't have to invert it from one kind of heat to another kind of heat. Um, and so solar thermal is a really easy way uh, to get in. And it doesn't necessarily have to be solar thermal water, which is what everyone thinks of when I say solar thermal. They're like, oh, yeah, yep. solar water heaters. We've heard 100% what about I was them. thinking of. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but the reality is, is that you can build a solar oven with a cardboard box, aluminum foil, and a piece of plexiglass. Um, you build a, you know, basically a very lightly insulated uh, reflective interior box, put a crock pot in it or a crock pot insert in it with food, cover it and come back at the end of the day and it'll be cooked, right? So that's super duper easy. 
Um, we talk about the solar thermal collectors, which they look like your solar water heater, but instead mm -hmm. of collecting, instead of running water through there, really all you're doing is heating air. So if you've got a big window in the front of your house, you're probably losing a lot of uh, heat through that window. You can actually offset that by building a very, very inexpensive solar collector, placing it in that window. And now, you know, think about it from the standpoint of if I've got a blacktop driveway or a concrete driveway, okay, they both get the exact same amount of sun, but the blacktop driveway is always going to be hotter than the concrete driveway simply because it's black. It collects more heat. And so if you think about that the same way, because I've, I've, I've said this to people and they're like, well, it's the same amount of sun coming through the window. How does doing any, anything going to impact the amount of, of sun that I get through the window? And it's like, well, you're not going to change the amount of sun. You're going to change how efficiently you can collect the radiation that's coming off the sun, that radiant energy, and then put it into your home. Um, so there's a couple of other easy things to do. Um, and there's, so let me, let me pitch a website here. There's a website called build it solar, B U I L D I T S O L A R.com. Uh, if you're getting started with this and you want to, you can go down the deepest rabbit hole you can think of on solar voltaic, photovoltaic, or you can get something very, very simple, uh, like building a solar oven from a cardboard box. Um, when, when we moved off grid and I wanted to play around with a bunch of different projects, that website actually helped and the first keep it uh, pretty well updated. Um, but yeah, so solar thermal is an easy way to get into it. It's not expensive. You can use regular components. You don't need anything special. You don't need any special tools. Um, even if you were to go so far as solar water heating, like we did at your house, Nicole, mm -hmm. um, we still just used, I mean, yes, there was some plumbing involved, right? So there's some plumbing. That's a skill set that you have to be able to use. Um, there in Tennessee, it's a three season system, right? So when it starts to get below freezing, we don't want to leave water in there. So we drain it. Um, but, you know, what's your payback on that? Have you figured it out? It's probably somewhere between 18 and 24 months, right? Yeah, I think so. So I think I, I had a 25% drop in, in propane use last year. And that was only really functioning for the last two or three months of the year, the season where I get my annual bill for propane, uh, but they were warm months. So we'll know, I'll know next year for sure how much that is, but that's, you know, a couple hundred bucks. And I spent, I think, you know, not counting the on-demand water heater, it was about $300 all in on building that, but the, the on-demand water heater was more. So that, that added another 800 bucks to the project. So it was, it was not a small upfront investment, but something that happened this summer was that I needed to excavate behind my house, which caused my propane to be disconnected. And I didn't have it reconnected for days. And so I was actually operating a hundred percent off of that solar water heater this summer. And it wasn't that bad. It didn't quite get it up to the 120 degrees but it was warm enough to take a bath or a shower and do dishes and all of that. And, and if I would have, I think timed the pump a little bit differently, cause I do turn it off at night when it's colder outside and just leave the warm water in the hot water tank. Um, then I think I would have had a higher temperature during that time, but I was, you know, focused on other things, of course. Sure. Sure. Yeah, so we we typically say a solar uh, hot water system will pay itself pay for itself within 24 months. Um, a solar thermal air collector, typically one season, one heating season, and and you have gained enough electricity to pay for the cost of building it. So, how does a solar uh, air collector heater thing work? Um, oh. Imagine a box that's shallow, right? But large, Let, mm -hmm. let's say it's the size of this window behind me. Okay. So what I would do is let's say to aim the front of that box directly at the sun on this window behind me, I would need to set that box at, let's call it 60 degrees. Okay. So I would build the box of a size that when it's placed at a 60 de degree angle from that window, 
there's no shade on the box. So the top of the window isn't shading it. All right. So let's just, for purposes of our conversation, let's say that that's two feet by four feet. So I've got a two foot by four foot box. It's insulated on the bottom and it's just two by fours on the sides. Inside that box, so it's three and a half inches deep. Inside that box, I have three layers of uh, black window screen. Okay, just cheap black window screen. Um, the Then I have a hole at the bottom of it on the back for air to come in. And I have a hole at the top of it in the back for air to go out. And then I just put some sort of glazing on the top of that. So whether it be some sort of, when I say glazing, I'm just talking about a clear piece of sheeting that will seal the air inside. All right. And that's inside the house or outside the house? That's inside the house. Okay. Yeah. Um, and so if I do everything that I just mentioned, um, what will happen is that cool air or the air that's in the box will heat up. It will rise and it will go through the top of the back, as I mentioned. And mm -hmm. that thermosiphon effect will pull cooler air into the bottom. So what I just described to you, you can probably build for less than $100. Yeah. And that's going to generate somewhere between a 20 and 40 degree temperature change from the air that's going in to the air that's coming out um, for as long as the sun hits it. It starts working literally as soon as the air inside the box gets hotter than the air outside. It starts working and then it stops working because it's in the house. It stops working as soon as that goes the other way, but you don't lose anything. You mentioned oh. when it gets cold with the solar water heater, you need to turn the circulator off, right? Yeah, yeah. You don't have to do that with a with an inside uh, solar air collector. All you're doing is utilizing the radiant energy of the sun with the black screen in there to heat the air up for free. So that's kind of like the ones I've seen where people take Coke cans and paint them black and they they have this air path yep. with a fan. That's That's that without the fan and way easier to build. Yes. Yeah, so the you've seen people do it out of aluminum gutters. Uh, yeah. You see the people that will cut the hole in the bottom and the top of the can and glue the cans together. This is yeah. the exact same process, but the three screen method is actually more efficient and cheaper. So it yeah. heats better than any other method of air collector and it's cheaper and it's easier to build. So when are we putting one in my kitchen window? I don't know, probably around Christmas. <laughs> yeah. Maybe we, that's, that's what we should do at the Christmas party. That'd be fun. There you go. Yeah. Okay. So we have a question from, from 30 day reviews. Is solar still the best choice for a state like North Dakota that has decent wind all the time? Um, it depends on what you want to do. Okay. So Wind, you, you don't really do small wind, okay? You do, um, you know, if you're going to do wind, you're going to have a decent sized turbine. Um, you need to have a fairly clear area to put it in. Um, and you need to have, you know, the cabling and the battery bank required to take, to utilize the electricity that you're generating. Um, you know, in a state like, like North Dakota, I'm trying to remember... Um, some of the maps that I've seen in the past, but I want to say North Dakota probably gets in the area of between two and three sun hours per day on average. And so that's definitely less than the rest of the country. Um, so there's, a, there, there's a, absolutely a, a difference between, okay, I want something that will charge my cell phone and my laptop and will keep some lights on in the house when the electricity isn't on versus I want to convert my whole house to an off grid type system. Um, in the second scenario, wind is probably better in an area like that. That's got, you know, it's the planes, right? Um, it's, that's probably the better option. Uh, but you're not going to put a wind uh, turbine in that will just give you a little bit of electricity to keep your chargers topped off and your, um, and a few lights on if, if the grid goes down. Yeah, that makes sense. Well, hopefully that got Justin's question answered. Now, I understand you're going to be going to the Self-Reliance Festival in Camden, right? On yes. October 23rd. 
tell us a little bit about what you're going to cover there because people can come see you in person do this. Yeah, so what we're going to cover there is just a basic system, a, a one solar panel system. Okay, and so we're gonna we're gonna talk about some of the basics of the things that you need to understand if you're going to put one of these systems together. Um, mm -hmm. The things that you need to understand if you actually want to go so far as to build a budget for maybe converting a portion of your home over to solar. But the most important thing that you'll see there. It, it really can only be done in person is we're going to take a solar panel. Ooh. We're going to show you how it connects to a charge controller, how that connects to a battery, how that connects to an inverter. We're going to talk mm -hmm. about if we were to go to two solar panels, what would we need to do with a charge controller to make that possible? Whether two solar panels is too much or not enough for the battery, where different things that we can do with the, a single individual battery. And so the system that I'll be showing you uh, at the Self-Reliance Festival, all in, all components, brand new, it's about $500, okay? Mm -hmm. Now, that system, the system limitation, any limitation on a solar system is typically going to be the battery, okay? Yeah. And so um, so what we're going to be looking at is a, it's called a Group 27 battery. It's got about an 80 amp hour rating at 12 volts, okay? It's just one 12-volt mm -hmm. battery. And on any lead acid batteries, which is what this is, we want to stay above 50% depth of discharge. So right. all that means is a battery that's rated for 80 amp hours, we only want to design the system to use 40 of that. Okay. And so with this system, um, <laughs> that's exactly right, Don. Two is one, <laughs> one is none. Um, so with this system, what you'll be able to do is, for example, charge up uh, a laptop battery from dead to full after the sun goes down or to be fully charged before the sun comes back up. Um, charge three or four cell phones. And I use the uh, iPhone 13 Pro as my model, which, which is I think has the second biggest uh, battery in terms of milliamp hours of any battery in a cell phone. Um, and run uh, a couple nine watt LED lights for a couple hours at night and then a couple hours the following morning. Mm -hmm. um, and so those things that I just mentioned, this single battery will do for three days off of a single charge. Okay. Wow. And, so, and how long does a charge take? One day. Off, one day. Yeah. One so, day with actual sun, not a cloudy day. Right. In so in Tennessee, it, it's I I live in Alabama right now, but I'm a Tennessean. Um, <laughs> we'll get and, you back someday. <laughs> that's right. You will. Uh, I promise. Um, and we're going to be in Tennessee when we do this demonstration. So in the state of Tennessee, one watt installed of solar photovoltaic will generate between 11 and 1200 watts a year mm -hmm. worth of electricity. And so to bring that down to the home level, um, a nine watt, um, led light bulb, if you were to run that for four hours a day on average for 365 days, you need between five and six watts installed of solar to take care of that one light bulb for the whole year. All right. Okay. And so when people think about solar and they start thinking about rooftop solar, they're like, oh man, in order to do anything, I've got to put, you know, all these panels up and I've got to have all this special cabling and combiner boxes and, or they may not even think about all of that stuff. Uh, they may think it's just too much. I can't do it. But, and that's why I'm going to show you what a one panel system can do, how easy it is to put together, how easy it is to expand. And so I mentioned that system with all brand new components, about $500. That's cables and everything. Yeah. Um, if you were to upgrade the inverter to it, so the whole system was about $700 then that inverter would be big enough to run any single appliance in your house other than a central um, HVAC unit. And mm -hmm. it can run off your car battery too. So it's like function stacking, right? We've got our solar system that runs off of our single battery. The solar panel is enough to where we could actually add another battery later if we wanted to. Um, if we wanted to just add and add and add onto that, we talk about, okay, we could start with this small charger that'll handle up to two uh, solar panels. 
or maybe this one that's a little bit bigger. It's about twice as expensive, but we could go up to nine or 10 or 11 or 12 panels on that. Cool. Okay. We got a question. Um, that's not the question. We have a question. Why wouldn't you want to use a deep cycle battery to have access to more battery in that system? <laughs> Yeah, so I was talking about a deep cycle battery. I don't know, Justin may be asking, um, why wouldn't we want to add more? Um, Justin, more batteries? I, yeah, if you could uh, clarify what you're asking for on that question. Um, but yeah, I was talking about a deep cycle battery. Okay. Um, yeah, and then we have another person who's used, they've just gone up to lithium. You're doing lithium now too, aren't you? Are you doing that upgrade? So... I am doing lithium in my designs yet. I don't have lithium at, on the off-grid property yet. Yeah. Um, yes. Yeah, so the next battery bank I put in will be a lithium battery bank. And so what I did was uh, last year, so so the initial battery bank went in in 2012. Um, and we used Trojan T105 golf cart batteries for that, which were about $115 a piece. And I had eight of them. Mm -hmm. And so... Last year, um, they were dead. I mean, they were blown out. Um, and so last year we decided to uh, replace the batteries, but I knew I was going to go to lithium on the off-grid property probably before we moved back there full-time. So we still have that property. I'm in Alabama for work. Um, yeah. But that's the plan is, is lithium. So what we did is when we replaced the battery bank in Linden, we actually mm -hmm. put a smaller bank in and we're using a higher depth of discharge. So we're, we're killing those batteries faster, but it allowed mm -hmm. me to get back to having capacity cheaper uh, because I knew that my next battery change was going to be lithium. So I would ask the question, uh, H wit 9,000. Um, did you go, did you use the same voltage for your battery bank or did you have to change anything up? And, and while we're waiting to see if we get an answer on that, um, I see the, the, the question. The clarification. Yeah. So, yep. so that's a great question. And so, uh, on any battery, except for a lithium iron phosphate battery, as far as I know, the more you use of its available capacity, the faster you're going to kill it. Okay. So batteries are typically rated when we talk about life cycle, we talk about how many cycles, right? So 365 cycles. We typically call that one year because the assumption is, is that you're going to cycle that battery down to 50 percent or 80 or whatever the case may be, and then charge it back up every single day. Now, the reality is we design that way, but people don't use their their systems that way. Um, most people, we design it so that let's say you want to you, you only want to go down to 20 percent and you really want to maximize the battery life. We'll design the system so that you hit 20% on a bad day. Well, every day is not a bad day. So uh, when you have people that, you know, designed that way, um, you know, what they ended up with is maybe 20% of the total days actually hit the design criteria. So the other 80%, you're not getting down that low. Uh, and then if you do a good job of, of battery maintenance, equalizing every month, things like that, uh, you can really extend that battery life. So, so that's a, how we took a battery bank that was designed for a five-year usable life in Linden, and it ended up lasting us eight years before we had to replace. Um, so, so yeah, so that's a really long way to answer the question, but but really the answer is the more you take out of the battery, the less times you can take that amount of energy out of the battery. Yeah, it looks like you have uh, an answer to. I used the same 24 Colt system. I replaced four each L16 batteries wired in series to make a 24 volt system. Okay, yeah. Uh, so, yeah, so I've got a 24 volt system in Linden right now. Um, I am actually considering stepping mine up to a 48 volt system uh, and replacing the inverter and then putting the inverter that I have in an outbuilding. Yeah. Um, haven't made that decision yet, but. Um, it's, I've, I've found that it's easier to get the 48 volt batteries at the amp hour ratings that, that I want to get than the 24. What's the most efficient way to turn solar into cooler air in hotter climates? Great question. Yeah. Ab great question. So, uh, it's, it's definitely easier to live off the grid where it's cooler. Okay. <laughs> um, as a matter of fact, I would say 
um, higher altitude. Uh, so closer to the equator, but higher in altitude is the best of both worlds because it's cooler, but because you're, you're closer to the equator, you get more sun. Um, so in my opinion, the most efficient way is to use solar power to move air. Um, and, and so I'm talking about fans. Okay. Um, the reality is, is that unless you have a lot of money to spend, you're not going to be taking a house that's got a, a standard HVA system and converting it to run off of solar. Um, I'm not saying it can't be done. It can absolutely be done, but it's expensive. Uh, we have a mutual friend that lives in Murfreesboro, Tennessee, or just outside. Um, and I've been working with him for about three years on a design. And we kept kind of going back and forth. Uh, do we want to do everything? Do we want to do a little bit that we want to do everything but the HVAC um, because, you know, this, the typical uh, American household, at least tool man, I know you're not uh, down here in the lower 48, but um, the typical house, about 50% of their electrical uses throughout the course of a year is either heating or cooling people. Uh, and then about another 14 to 20% is heating water and then about another 8% is heating or cooling food, okay? Um, so, you know, you could, uh, with this, this one panel system that I'm talking about, you could actually plug during the day, I wouldn't run this off the battery, but during the day, you could actually plug in um, an ice maker and you could make ice during the day. Um, and so that would be a way, you know, just stick ice in all your clothes and in plastic bags and put them all over you. Right. That would be a way where you could <laughs> use solar to cool yourself. Um, but, you know, someone that lived off the grid uh, for years, you know, I don't right at this moment. But what we found is that when you live in it every day, you acclimate to it. And so um, today I'm, I'm currently sitting in a climate controlled room, right? I sleep in a climate controlled room. Um, if I go outside and it's 9,500 degrees, I'm very uncomfortable. Um, I'm not doing a lot of work, right? I'm doing maybe 30 minutes worth of work and then I got to come back inside and cool off. When I lived off grid, it could be hundred degrees and I could go out and work half the day before taking a break. Now, of course I'm chugging water, trying to stay hydrated, but in terms of my body's ability to, um, to deal with the heat, it comes from dealing with it. It doesn't come from technology, so to speak. We're, we're meant to, um, you know, I think it's uh, the salinity, salinity of the blood changes and the thickness of the blood changes depending on how hot or cold you are. And that only takes about two weeks to get used to, according to uh, doctors that I've talked to about it. Okay, interesting. Okay, we've got a related question. Have you seen the direct solar to AC mini split systems? Seems too good to be true. Uh, I have not seen the solar direct to AC mini split, but you can absolutely run a mini split off of a, a decent size solar system. Um, as a matter of fact, I designed a system just this year and helped install down in Florida uh, for a guy that's building an off grid place from scratch. And we designed uh, their house to run off of a mini split system. Um, mm -hmm. it was a, it was a, I want to say it was a 24,000 BTU unit and it had it basically had two 12,000 BTU zones. Yeah. So they had the bedroom zone and they had like the great room zone, which was a com combination living room. And so the idea in the great room was only to knock humidity down because it's Florida. Uh, and then the bedroom was to get a decent place to sleep in. But, you know, when we were off grid, we had uh, a window unit in the bedroom and a window unit in my daughter's bedroom. And, you know, when it was bedtime, it was the, the whole idea was let's just get it down enough or get the humidity down enough to where a 20 inch box fan makes it comfortable for everyone. Right. So so on the mini splits, I've not done a ton of research into them other than I've had customers come to me and say, um, here's what I have. Here's what I'm going to put in and here's how much I'm going to use it. And I want you to design a system around that. And so the interesting thing about those folks is they don't have the mini split in yet, 
but they are mining for crypto with all of their excess solar instead of running the AC unit. So that's kind of <laughs> neat. That's funny. Okay, so let's go back to the cooling topic. What are some, thinking about it differently than, you know, the question was originally, how do you turn sun into cool? How do you design your off-grid space so that it either self-cools or there's an alternative way to make it cool in a hotter climate? Yeah, so if you if you're if you're um, fortunate enough to be able to design the house before it's built, you can strategically place rooms um, that you're going to be in the most in quadrants of the house that get the least amount or zero direct sunlight. So um, at our off grid place, the master bedroom is downstairs, and it is in the northeast corner of the house. So I get a little bit of sun in the morning through the window as it rises up, then I get, then I'm shaded. And then basically the rest of the house acts as a solar barrier throughout the rest of the day. And I never get any direct sun other than first thing in the morning. We also have a really cool overhang on the off grid house. And so shade really is the answer to your question. And I'm just kind of expounding on that. Um, so our overhang is it is it's about four foot deep uh, at the lower part and it's about eight foot deep at the upper part. And so what that does is when the sun is higher in the sky, it keeps more of the face of the building shaded throughout the day. And then when it's lower in the winter, we actually get solar gain because it's below uh, that angle. So the strategic application of shade is super important. Um, determining where cardinally you place rooms you're going to be in a lot. Um, your kitchen is typically going to generate more heat than any room in your house. So it's thinking about where you're putting the kitchen, uh, thinking about the ability to ventilate your kitchen easily um, or do a lot of, of, of kitchen related functions outside instead of inside. You know, use your kitchen a lot in the winter where that heat helps you. And then uh, ground contact. If you have the ability to um, you know, put in a walkout basement. Um, we, when we lived in Eastern Tennessee, uh, we, we had a house with a basement that, you know, was three sides ground contact. And in the summer we spent most of our time downstairs, uh, because we did not need to climate control that area at all because it was pleasant to be in, uh, just because it was ground contact. So strategic application of shade using your cardinal directions and where your sun is, and then ground contact would be great ways to passively uh, prevent your house from getting too hot when you're off grid. Yeah, I was really impressed with how your your house is designed in Linden, I think it is, so that when the, the sun is low in the sky, the sun does hit your house. And then when it's summertime, the shade is enough to keep the sun from warming that southern facing wall. That's yeah. right. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, as a matter of fact, uh, when, when I lived there and I was working from home a lot, um, most days I would work from the front porch, which was yeah. the southern facing side of the house. So I had the sun right there, but I was in the shade all day. I had a little fan blown on me. It was perfectly comfortable. Yeah, that's why I built the wall of tomatoes. I took that idea and I was like, well, if I don't have the overhead, I can just put plants in front of it and then it doesn't heat up. And it totally made a difference here for, yeah. for temperature. Yeah. So. Okay, Shade. well, it works. Guys, if you want to pick Sean's brain in person on October 23rd, we've got the Self Reliance Festival. It's in Camden, Tennessee. That's about an hour south ish, southwest ish of Nashville. And it's going to be at Special Operations Equipment. Tickets are 30 bucks. And we're going to have a bunch of different demos throughout the day. We've got Sean doing his solar demo. I'm doing a mozzarella cheese making demo. I've got Tactical Rednet talking about how to assess your property for defense and security. I've got a welding demo, beer making, all sorts of things that you might want to learn. Um, check it out. And we would love to see you there. Sean, I wanted to thank you for being on today. I know it was sort of a last minute thing I sprung on you. I'm like, we got to talk about solar. <laughs> But he can always talk about solar, right, guys? He's this oh, is the yeah, only person it. that's made solar make sense to me. <laughs> yeah. So thanks for being on, Sean. Absolutely. <laughs>